الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي إن شاء الله we're here tonight to take a journey of the hereafter are you guys ready for that journey? I ask you a couple of things before we start. Number one is, this journey that we'll take tonight will be as effective as you want it to be. How many of you have heard lectures about the hereafter before? How many of you have heard this one? I don't know why you're here again. It's the same one, wallahi. <laughs> But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ ذِكْرَ تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ May we remind each other as the reminder is good for the believers. So this is a reminder for me, it's a reminder for you, and inshallah for those who have not heard this before, number one, you must imagine. The hereafter is an unseen world. We've never seen it, we don't know how it looks. But it will only be as effective as you can imagine it tonight. So that's number one. So shut off your cell phones, put them on vibrate, do whatever you need to do, but I want your undivided attention, inshallah. So I'll give you 30 seconds, look at your cell phones again, because everyone thinks they're on vibrate until they actually ring. So just take a look, I'll actually, I put mine in my bag. The second thing, inshallah, is I want you to unleash your emotions. Let yourself cry. There are layers and layers on top of our hearts. Inshallah, crying lets this all out. So today when we go and describe the five stages that we're going to go through, starting with death, the grave, the day of judgment, hellfire, and ending with Jannah, these, th these five stages, each one of them, I want you to get into it. I want you to feel yourself there and let your eyes cry. You will, inshallah, by, by the end of this, you will feel a spiritual enlightenment. So, as I said, our itinerary tonight is five steps, five stages, five phases. Let's, inshallah, get started with the first one. Now, throughout this lecture, those who've attended this before, I will use different techniques. I'll ask you sometimes to stand up, to close your eyes, to do different things. Please cooperate quickly and silently. So let's get started. Let's try this out. Everyone stand up. Close your eyes and just focus um, on what I'm going to say. Just close your eyes. I want you to imagine yourself sitting at home. See yourself there. Feel the couch that you're sitting on. Look at your kids running around. You're watching TV, you're reading a book, you're on the computer, whatever you usually do. And suddenly, you feel this immense pain in your chest. Put your hands on your chest. This immense pain you don't know what it's coming from. Is it the biryani I had for iftar? I don't know exactly. It's just this immense pain. And you take a deep breath, and you think it will go away, but it doesn't. And this pain is just increasing, and suddenly you see yourself sweating. You stand up to find something, a cup of water, some medicine, but as soon as you stand up, you fall to the ground. Your family comes rushing to you. What's happening? Are you okay? You look at them. A tear comes out of your eye. But you cannot utter a single word. Because at that moment, brothers and sisters, you can see angels coming in to the room you know that it's your time. 
and suddenly you feel this tingling feeling in your toes. And it starts to crawl up your legs. Everything it touches turns blue, cold, and dies. Your soul is slowly coming out of your body. This tingling feeling, you want to stop it, but it, you can't. It moves up your legs. It's at your hips. Your whole lower body is dead. It's cold. It's blue. You try to move it, but you can't. Your family's calling 911, trying to save you. You want to tell them some final words, but not a single word comes out from the pain and the agony of death. You look at your kids. You don't know what's going to happen to them. You look at your wife or your son. And suddenly this tingling feeling keeps crawling up your body. It's at your chest. You're sweating. You're coughing. You try to stand up, but you can't. Most of your body is dead by now. And you know that in a few moments, it's over. Brothers and sisters, the soul keeps coming up. And you're at your throat. You feel this tingling feeling at the throat. And the soul is just about to leave the body. And you're just about to die and something happens. Have a seat, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla idha balagat it taraqiya wa qila man raq. Wa dhanna annahu al firaq. That when the soul will come out and it will stop here at the collarbone, at the trachea, and everyone will say, Who can help him? Someone help him, someone save him. Wa dhanna annahu al firaq. But you know that it's over. You know that you're dying. You know that you're leaving this world. Allah says, and the foot or your, your leg will be on top of the other like this. Out of the pain and agony of death, the soul is leaving your body. Your next destination is to Allah. The next stop is the hereafter. It's over, brothers and sisters. At that moment of death, when the soul is right here, and your whole body is dead, and you only have a breath left, something happens. Something that the Prophet used to seek refuge from every salah. It is the test of death. And let me explain this. Throughout your whole life, all 50, 60, 70 years of your life, shaitan is trying to push you astray. And he comes and whispers to us certain things to do and not to do. And throughout our life, he succeeds sometimes and he fails sometimes. But this is his last chance. Right? You're dying. Your life is ending. And he only has one chance left to push you astray. So he will come to you in the form and shape of someone that is dear to you that has died before you. A mother, father, son, whoever. And he will come up to you at that moment when the soul is about to leave the body and he will tell you, Ahmed. I am coming from the unseen world. The true religion there is not Islam. It is something else. And you have that split second to decide. But brothers and sisters, the challenge is, it's not up to you. It's not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا Allah is the only one that on, on that day, at that moment, 
can give you the ability to say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And it happens how? It happens based on how you lived your life. Were you truthful to La ilaha illallah? Were you from those who worshipped Allah truly loving no one but Him, fearing no one but Him, hoping in no one but Him? Did you truly submit to La ilaha illallah? Or was it just words that came out of your mouth? We can all, mashallah, we can all say Islamic words, Assalamu alaikum, brother, jazakallah khair, barakallah we can all use these words. But what's inside, only Allah knows. You and Allah. You can, be, you can look, appear to be the most pious person in this community. But only Allah knows who you really are. And at that moment, brothers and sisters, the real you comes out. I meet a lot of people that feel that because their name is Muhammad or Ahmed or Fatima, that they're guaranteed Jannah, sooner or later. I mean, all right, aren't all Muslims going to Jannah eventually? I'll, you know, go to hellfire a little bit and come back out, but, you know, I'm going to Jannah. I'm Muslim. Well, the, the challenge is, brothers and sisters, will you die as a Muslim? When this test of death comes to you, will Allah grant you la ilaha illallah or not? Because I have known people and I'm not just talking out of stories. This is true stories that have happened to people I know. That I lived with a, lot, a, a, a long portion of my life. And on their, te on their deathbed, they lived their whole life. Everyone knows them as a Christian. And on their deathbed, at that last moment, they said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad. And I know the opposite. People whose names are Ahmed and Muhammad and they live their whole life. Jazakallah khair, barakallahu feek, mashaAllah, astaghfirullah. And on their deathbed, when they should say, la ilaha illallah, they were singing music, and talking about business. That's it, brothers and sisters. What did you really live your life as? So the first thing I want to stop at here today is you can't fake your Iman. You can't. And even if you do it your whole life, you're just faking yourself. Because this is the moment that really counts. You know like those talk shows, or those, uh, sorry, those uh, like who wants to be a millionaire and stuff like that. If you know the answer, the host can do nothing to shake you. But if you don't, if you're guessing, if you do not live la ilaha illallah, then at this moment of death, you will be shaken. Even Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, one of the you know, pillars, scholars of Islam, on his deathbed, his son, while he was dying, his son came up to him and said, Father, say la ilaha illallah. And what the son heard was, no, no, not yet, not yet. And he would faint. And he would come back. And he would say, Father, say la ilaha illallah. You're about to die, say it. And Ahmed ibn Hamdan would say, no, no, not yet, not yet. And he would faint again. The son was afraid that his father would die without saying La ilaha illallah. The third time Imam Ahmed came back to his conscience, he said, Father, what are you doing? And he said, the shaitan has come to me. And he has said, Ahmed, you got away from me. And he said, no, no, not yet. As long as the soul has not left the body, you can still trick me. And this is Ahmed ibn Hanbal, brothers and sisters. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a life of la ilaha illallah. So that he, and only he subhanahu wa ta'ala, can grant us that thabat, that steadfastness when we need it. And the last words, to leave. And when the soul leaves the body, it comes out of the mouth. 
and the eyes can see it. So if anyone has saw a person die, you will see their eyes go up actually looking at the soul coming out of the body. May Allah grant us la ilaha illallah to be our last words. Brothers and sisters, there are pains, agony, sakarat associated with death. And even the Prophet ﷺ experienced them. And those who remember the last scene of him, when he is sitting, lying on the lap of our mother Aisha, and he's sweating in pain because of the agony of death. May Allah make these sakarat easy on us. Except for the shaheed. The martyr does not feel any of the agony of death. With the first drop of blood that comes out of his body, he doesn't feel anything at all. So brothers and sisters, to continue our journey, every one of us will die. Every one of us will die. And brothers and sisters, let me, let me, let me reflect here for a second. I did not grow up as a practicing Muslim. And there were certain turning points in my life. And one of them was when I learned about this test of death, the fitnat al-mawt. And it was coupled with another verse, this verse, in the chapter of the cave. قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَهْمَالًا Should we not tell you about those who really, you know, their, their, their deeds were, were just really bad? Who? Those who went astray in this world, but actually thought they were doing good. And when I heard that verse, sorry, not heard it, when I really thought about that verse, with the test of death, it freaked me out. Because all my life I thought, I'm not bad. I mean, I pray a little bit, I fast, you know. Alhamdulillah, I'm better than others. Look around you. Look at what the non-Muslims are doing. I'm much better than them. And so I lived most of my life thinking, Alhamdulillah, I'm not bad. And when you look at this verse, that they may be the biggest losers, those who went astray because they thought they were doing good, but they weren't. And then this test of death that will really bring out the real you, it was a realization for me that I need to start understanding what Allah actually wants me to do. And then I can try to take steps towards that. Moving along with our journey, the soul has left the body. You are now dead. That's it. That's where the journey starts. And brothers and sisters, when we talk about death, a lot of people think that it's like sleep. It's not. Not at all. It's really like boarding a plane here in DC, and then 14 hours later, landing somewhere in the Middle East. You walk outside, you talk a different language, you have different currency in your pocket, you may have different clothes on. Everything on the outside about you looks different, but you are still you. You remember when you were in DC, right? You remember everything you did before that. That's the analogy of death. The soul will leave the body, but you remember everything. You remember your friends. You remember how you died. You remember the last things you did. You remember everything. Who saw the movie Avatar? Come on, really? Movies, yes? All right. So last year I couldn't use this analogy because you know, the movie wasn't out. But it's just like an avatar. It really is. This body, this piece of dirt, that's all it is. The soul is what makes it move and talk and think and remember and everything. That's the soul. Take the soul out, that's what happens in death, and this is just a body, a suit, an avatar. That's all it is. 
so you will still remember. So inshallah, for the rest of this journey, the easiest way to imagine this is just imagine yourself, as is right now, going through everything that we will discuss. Before we move into the grave, just a couple of last moments in death. Brothers and sisters, when that moment of death comes, there's either two, one of two scenarios that happen. Either dark angels, black angels from hellfire come into the room with a wrapping from hellfire and they come where your head is and they say, Oh, you bad soul, you evil soul, come out to the anger and wrath of Allah. The soul will freak out and it will hide in every vein and artery in your body. The angel of death will pull the soul out of your body. The hadith says, like a wet piece of wool in the middle of a bush of thorns. Can you imagine that? Ripping every vein and artery and nerve in your body till the soul comes out. It is wrapped in this wrapping from hellfire. And it ascends to the first sky. The inhabitants of the first sky, the angels, they say, who does this filthy soul belong to? And the angels say, this is the soul of so and so. And they ask permission for the soul to ascend to the second sky, but they are denied permission. And they hear a sound from above saying, write their book in the lowest levels. And this soul, brothers and sisters, is left to fall from the sky into the grave. On the contrary, may Allah grant us the other scene. When you are about to die, angels from paradise come into the room with white faces and they say to the soul, come out to the pleasure and happiness of Allah. And the soul comes out of the body, the hadith says, like a drop of water out of a pitcher. It is wrapped in this wrapping of Jannah and a scent from Jannah is put on top of it and the soul starts to ascend to the first sky. And all the inhabitants, the angels of the first sky say, who does this beautiful soul belong to? And the angels say, this is the soul of so and so, your name, inshallah. And the angels ask permission for the soul to ascend to the second sky, and they are granted permission. The third sky, the fourth sky, all the way up to the seventh sky. And when they reach the seventh sky, they hear a voice that says, who does this beautiful soul belong to? And Allah knows, of course. And the angels say, this is the soul of so and so. And Allah says, write their books in the highest level. And the soul ascends back down into the grave, ready for its next journey, which we will talk about. The last thing in the station called death. Brothers and sisters, you might have heard people tell you when people die, they see a flashback of their whole life in front of them. That is true by the hadith of the Prophet where the Prophet told the companions one day, he said, whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah will love to meet them. And whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah will hate to meet them. Do you want to hate to meet Allah? So the companions got a little worried and they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, but we're all afraid of death. Isn't that what you're talking about? And the Prophet said, No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this. At the moment of death, all your deeds are revealed to you. Your whole life, you will see it in front of you. So if you have good deeds, you will love to meet Allah. And if you have bad deeds, then you will hate to meet Allah. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to try to make this as real as possible. So I need you to do something for me. Everyone close your eyes right now. 
We're going to try an exercise. Just while you're sitting down, just close your eyes. Everyone. I want you to think of yesterday. Just yesterday. Try to think of everything you did yesterday. Everything good, everything bad as if someone was recording your whole day yesterday and you are watching that movie, just yesterday. Two days, so yesterday and the day before. What about last week? I want you to try to imagine all of last week all of last week, everything you did good, everything you did bad. What about last month? The whole last month. Try to imagine. Try hard. Close your eyes. Really think, what did I do all of last month? Everything good, everything bad. All of August. I'll challenge you, brothers and sisters, and go back three months. Think about June and May. I'm going to actually give you 30 seconds of silence. Just try to look at all your good deeds and bad deeds for the past three months. What about last year, from this Ramadan to the past Ramadan? Is it getting harder? Open your eyes, brothers and sisters. Is it getting hard? Listen to this verse. Ahsahu Allahu wa nasuhu. Allah has gathered all this information, and He remembers it, but you, forget. You couldn't even think of all the bad deeds you did last year. And those are the bad deeds that you know are bad deeds. Will we love to meet Allah, brothers and sisters? When that moment comes and you see your whole life in front of you, all the moments that you talked back to your parents. And I, I emphasize this example because these are talking back to your parents is a major sin. A major sin. Like drinking alcohol. You would remember if you, if you in that year, you had some alcohol. And you would ask for forgiveness. But when you roll your eyes at your parents or you yell back, whatever age you are, do we consider that a major sin? When we talk about people, brothers and sisters, this, these deeds, may Allah protect us from them, may cause us to look at our lives at that moment and hate to meet Allah. And these are things that we could have avoided. Sisters, Talking, mashallah. I have three sisters myself, I know. Brothers, we hold grudges against each other. Why? When you look back at your life, is it worth it? And wallahi, we will all go through this moment. So think about it right now. And from this moment on, you can change that. Brothers and sisters, we ended the station about death. You are now entering the grave. This station, the second step, starts, and I want you please to imagine this, starts with you actually probably spending the night in a morgue somewhere. You died last night. They put you in a morgue. You're in a drawer. 
they pull you out today, this morning, and they take you to Washington. A couple of good people that you know will put you on a bench. They will cover your private parts, and they will wash you with a hose. They'll wash your right side, and then your left side. And you are seeing this. You are seeing your body helpless. It's over. It's over. That's it. And after they wash you, they bring a wrapping, a kefen, a piece of cloth, and they put you on top of it. And those who have seen this will never forget it. Because at a certain moment, and I will never forget it, I've been in these a couple of times, where the person is laying right here, and you take a piece of cloth, and you put it on top of their face. That's it. The life of a person just ended. It's so symbolic, subhanAllah. You can see the person one moment, and the other moment, it's just a white piece of cloth. They wrap you seven times, and then put a knot right here, right here, here and where your feet are. They put you in a box. They bring you through those doors, those doors. And they will put you right here, just like the janazah we had today. Right here, brothers and sisters. And they will send an email the night before saying, brother or sister so-and-so has passed away. Their janazah is after dhuhr prayer. That's you. That's you. And you will be right here. And the Imam will say, Salatul Janazah. How many people will be in the masjid? How many people know you? How, pe how many people know you for the good that you have done? And they will come here. And the Imam will say, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And with the third Allahu Akbar, the people start making dua for you. And you, the soul, you're yelling, you're screaming, make more dua for me, I need it. But no one can hear you. And it's a matter of moments. And the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. And they rush to take you. The good soul, brothers and sisters, is saying, عجلوني, عجلوني. Quicker, take me to my grave. Take me. I want to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Come on, I died. I don't want anything from this world. عجلوني, عجلوني. Quicker, take me, bury me, because that's when my real life starts. But the bad soul, brothers and sisters, is screaming and saying, stop, I'm afraid. Where are you taking me? Slow down, slow down. Brothers and sisters, there's something very interesting. I want you to live this because there's only two paths. It's either really nice or really bad. Wallahi, there's nothing in the middle. Throughout the rest of this night, you will see two extremes, and that's it. There's nothing in the middle. Wallahi, if there was, our actions would have been different. But from the moment you die, it's either ultimate pleasure or ultimate pain. How can we as humans be so ignorant, so stupid not to see that and waste a couple of years in our lives for an eternity of pain, an eternity of fear. And they will rush you out, put you in a car, and take you to your grave. The grave is already dug, and they will put you, they will lie you down, seven feet under. And brothers and sisters, the moment that if you haven't seen please go see it, where they put the body on the right side, they untie the knot, the brother comes out of the grave, 
and they say, Bismillah. And they start putting dirt on top of you. Just piles and piles of dirt. Until you and the ground are one. And the people there are looking, crying, making dua for you. But it's only a matter of minutes. And they will leave you. As soon as you enter your grave, the grave will squeeze you. That squeeze could be a welcome back home hug, or it could be a squeeze that will break every bone in your body. But it will squeeze you. May Allah make it easy on us. The grave is dark. Very dark. And you are afraid. And at that, that moment, brothers and sisters, the two ugliest creations of Allah, called Munkar and Nakir, they will walk into your grave. They will sit you up. These angels, Allah had created in a very frightening form. They will sit you up and they will ask you questions. When they sit you up, I want you to feel your heart racing because you will be terrified. And with their voices like thunder and their eyes like lightning, they will ask you, who is your Lord? Who did you submit to? The mu'min will say, my Lord is Allah. They will ask, what is your way of life? The mu'min will say, my way of life is Islam, is submission to Allah. And what do you say about the man that was sent to you? You will say, he is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they will say, sadaqt. You have said the truth, and they will order the grave to widen. And this grave will turn into a garden of paradise. And you will chill and have fun and actually go visit other people in the grave. And remember, you're conscious. You remember your friends from the dunya. I'll go to Brother Farhan and, how are you doing, Farhan? And, hey, what's that guy doing up there? Did he get married? You know, you're talking about the people of the dunya. You're having fun. You're visiting each other. A very nice life. On the other side, may Allah protect us. They will sit you up. And they will say, they will ask the same question. And you will, not you, the person will not be able to answer. They will say, um, 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 I, I don't know. What's your way of life? Um, um, I don't know. They said, they said, in another hadith, they said we should submit. They said. And the angel will say, Kadhabt, you have lied. You don't know anything. And they will order the grave to become a pit of hellfire. And the grave will start burning till the day of judgment. And the grave will squeeze and tighten and become narrower and darker till every bone in your body breaks. And brothers and sisters, it doesn't stop there. But there are different forms of punishment in the grave, depending on what you've done. Listen to this form. A person in the grave is lying down, and an angel comes with a huge boulder the size of this world. And he comes where his head is at, and he lets the boulder loose, and it comes down, and it crushes his skull. Imagine yourself. We get hit in the head by a rock and we're crying. Imagine. Why? What sin? What did this person do to deserve that? They were lazy when it came to performing prayers. Lazy. 
we're not talking about those who do not pray. We're talking about those who were lazy. Time for prayer comes, you're still on the couch. Salah? All right. I got to Asr. Two minutes before Asr, you're up there. MashaAllah, you're done. Lazy when it comes to Salah. That's the punishment in the grave continuously, brothers and sisters. Those who dealt with the riba interest are swimming in a, in a river of rusted blood, drinking from it. And every time they try to come out of this river, they are pushed by an angel back in. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ was walking beside a grave and Allah gave him the capability to hear the punishment of the grave. And while he was walking, he stopped in front of a grave and he told the companions, these people are being punished. And it's not because of something major they did. It's something minor they could have avoided. And the companions asked, what? And the Prophet said, they did not clean themselves after using the bathroom. And they talked about people. They talked about people. Two things people are punished in the grave because of. Brothers and sisters, may Allah protect us. And there are many, many other forms of punishment, but for the sake of time, I want to try to get to the Jannah station as quick as possible. I'm going to show you a picture right now. And I don't like showing this picture, but I've been asked to. And I'll tell you why. Some people can't imagine this. What I'm going to show you right now, and if you have your children, I, I advise you not to show this to them. All right? And what I'm going to show you is a picture of, now everyone wakes up, so it's a picture, a graphic. Really? SubhanAllah. What I'm going to show you is the picture of a body that was put into the grave. And it was, it was, it was normal. Everything was fine. And a couple, uh, I think it was a, a year or two afterwards, there was some flooding. So they, they, were, they were opening the graves to move the bodies. And this is what they saw. You will see a mutilated body. Of course, there, nothing was in the grave. And the ulama, the scholars, were asked about this from even back in the day. And they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could show us some forms of the punishment of the grave as a lesson for us. So I'm not going to show it for long, just for you to imagine. As you can see, his face is totally, um, may Allah protect us uh, from this. The point I'm trying to make is, this is real. What happens in the grave, may Allah protect us from it, are different forms of punishment. Different forms of punishment based on certain actions that you did. And this period of the grave is a waiting period up to this. The third step, the Day of Judgment. Just a quick disclaimer here. Um, from this point on, a lot of the scholars have different sequences for the events. So the events are known, but what sequence these events come in are different from one scholar to another. I tried to look at the majority of the opinions and and put a, a, a sequence to take us through this journey. So if you read a book that has different sequence, that's fine. It's all, inshallah, um, trials from different scholars. Let me start by introducing a new character in our journey. This character, his name, he's an angel. His name is Israfil. Israfil is the angel in charge of blowing into the trumpet, blowing into the horn. The Prophet وسلم, during the journey of Isra and Mi'raj, the ascension journey, he saw this angel. And let me show you how he saw him. 
He saw him, the Prophet ﷺ describes, he said, he had one foot in front of the other. He had the trumpet on his lips. He took a deep breath. And you know when you're right, right when you're about to blow into something, your, your face does like this, right? So he's just about to blow into it, and he's looking from the corner of his eye towards Allah, ready for the signal to blow. 1400 years ago. Israfil was standing like this. When the Prophet ﷺ came down from this journey and was very active in, in, in salah and in acts of worship, and his wife was telling him to, to, to take it easy, he said, how can I take it easy when Israfil, when the person or the angel in charge of the trumpet has his lips on the trumpet ready to blow? There's no time. There's no time. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the signal, and only He subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when this is, the angel will blow into the trumpet, and every living creature on the face of the earth will be shocked. Everything will be shocked, except for a couple of angels. These angels are Israfil, Mikael, Jibril, the angel of death, and the angels that hold up the throne of Allah. And after everyone is shocked and dead, Allah will ask the angel of death, who is left alive? And the angel of death will repeat what I just said, Israfil, Jibril, Mikael, and the angels that hold up the throne of Allah, me and you, Ya Allah, and you are the one that does not die. And Allah will tell the angel of death, take the soul of Israfi. Then take the soul of Mikael. Then take the soul of Jibreel. And he will ask, who is left? Angel of death. And the angel of death will say, the angels that hold up the throne of Allah, me and you, ya Allah, and you are the one that does not die. And Allah will order the angel of death to take the souls of the angels that hold up the throne of Allah. And Allah will ask, who is left? And the angel of death will say, me, ya Allah, and you, and you are the one that does not die. And in a narration, Allah will tell the angel of death, go and take your own soul. And the angel of death will go to a land between the heavens and the earth. And he will take his own soul in a scene, brothers and sisters, that's described that from the, sh the, sh the scream that the angel of death will produce, if the people of the world were alive, they would have died again in shock. And that the angel of death would say, if I knew death was so painful, I would have been more merciful on the souls of the believers. And then Allah will ask, who is left? but no one will answer. Who is left? But no one will answer. To who is kingdomship today? Nothing answers. There's nothing but Allah. This is how it started. This is how it will end. Nothing alive. No atom, no cell. Nothing there except Subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of all of this. And Allah will stay in this state of nothing but Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for 40, 40 years, 40 months, 40 days, doesn't really make a difference to us. And then Allah will order Israfil to come back to life. Mikael, Jibreel, and the angels that hold up the throne of Allah. And he will order Israfil to blow again in the trumpet to start the day of judgment. But listen carefully, because something happened at that moment. Allah sends Jibreel and Mikael with the keys of Jannah to open the grave of one person. So they come down on a special mission. 
they opened the grave of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. They open his grave. The Prophet ﷺ asks, what is today? What's happening? And Jibreel says, today is the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, the next word to come out of the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ is, what about my ummah? SubhanAllah, he's asking about us. He didn't ask about his wife, not his daughter, not his son. He didn't ask about his family. He didn't ask about himself. He asked about us. Because he knows that we will need him that day. What about my ummah? What's going to happen to them? Brothers and sisters, do you love the Prophet because he loves you. Wallahi, he loves you. On a side note, it's just a, it's a beautiful hadith. It just comes to my head right now and I have to share it. He was sitting with his friends one day and he says, I really miss my beloved ones. And the companions are like, Ya Rasulullah, we're right here. I mean, we're sitting with you. You don't really have to miss us. I mean, we're right here. And he says, no, 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 you're my friends, but I miss my beloved ones. And they ask, who, who are your beloved? I and mean, we thought, you know, we were your beloved ones. And he says, no, these will be people that will come after me, who have never seen me, that believe in me. We are. We are his beloved ones, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is he beloved to us? as we are to him. Because at that day, brothers and sisters, he will ask about you. Jibreel will give him the, the keys to paradise and the day of judgment starts. Brothers and sisters, you are in the ground. You will hear this second blow in the horn and you know that it's time. I see a lot of young people. Let me give an analogy here. When you do something wrong and you hear your father walk into the house and call your name, Ahmed, oh my God. You know that feeling? You know that feeling, right? SubhanAllah, when we hear that second blow in the horn, we get that feeling because we know the day of judgment is starting. And whether we like it or not, your bodies will be pushed out of the ground. People will pop out of the ground, left and right, naked. But no one is looking at no one because of the fear of this day. And we come out to a white land, and people are just popping out of the ground. Every creature that was ever created comes out. And brothers and sisters, we're all standing there, waiting. And suddenly we hear a caller that says, Everyone, come this way. Come this way. There will be a caller that will guide you, that will tell you where to come. And all creation of Allah will start marching towards one land, the land of judgment. The disbeliever will say, this is going to be a tough day. They know. This is going to be a tough day. I want you to try to imagine how this looks like, brothers and sisters. An open white piece of land. No mountains, no landmarks. All the creation of Allah goes there. The throne of Allah is put. So it's, it, there's nothing there but the throne of Allah. And Allah brings back the sun, but a mile away from our heads that if we were still in our human form, we would have died out of the heat. 
And there is only the shade of the throne of Allah on that day. There are seven types of people that will be under the shade of the throne of Allah. Do you want to be one of those? Let me tell you these seven, not in order. Number one, a just ruler. Someone who is responsible of other people that dealt with them justly. Number two, a person who remembered Allah in privacy and feared Him and they cried. A tear came out of their eyes. That will qualify you to be under the shade of the throne of Allah. Number three, a person who gave charity in secrecy that even his left hand didn't know what his right hand gave. Number four, a person that was seduced, a man that was seduced by a woman of beauty and power and he said, I fear Allah. Number five, a person whose heart is attached to the mosque, to the masjid. SubhanAllah, it's Ramadan, look around you. Look around, look how many people are in this masjid. Is your heart attached to the masjid after Ramadan? Do you feel something's wrong when you don't come to the masjid, to the house of Allah? Number six, a youth that was raised in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before I say number seven, can everyone stand up? Quickly and quietly. I want you to look at the person beside you. I want you to give them a big hug and tell them, I love you for the sake of Allah. You should find out what their name is if you really love them for the sake of Allah. Have a seat, brothers and sisters. If this was more than just stretching for you, and you really meant it, the seventh type of people under the shade of the throne of Allah are two people who love each other for the sake of Allah. So if you were actually sincere right now, not just, hey, bro, how you doing? All right? If you were actually sincere right now, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this bond of brotherhood and sisterhood the reason why we are under the shade of the throne. This is serious. Let me tell you a story. I think it's Abdullah ibn Umar. A man came up to him and he said, I love you for the sake of Allah. I, we would just say, Jazakallah khair, you know. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, wait, what did you just say? Are you serious about that? The guy freaked out. All right. He said, well, yeah, I just said, I love you for the sake of Allah. And he said again, well, wait, what did you just say? Are you serious about that? And he said, yeah, I love you for the sake of Allah. And Abdullah ibn Umar said, because I heard the Prophet wasallam say, if two people love each other for the sake of Allah, then Allah will shade them under his throne on the day of judgment. So brothers and sisters, while you're sitting down, look at the person beside you and say it for real. Come on, heart to heart. You don't love them because they'll get you the new iPhone, or because they'll babysit your son, or because, you know, they'll find you a nice job. You just love them for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of Allah plus, plus, plus. We're all standing there. We're all standing there. And it's a long day. It's 50,000 years that day. 50,000 years. We stand in Taraweeh for two hours. And we're like, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Sheikh, come on. 50,000 years we are standing for the believers. And as, as much as your faith is, 
you, it will go quicker and quicker till you feel it like a very light salah. But during this wait, brothers and sisters, during this wait, a couple of things happen. Number one, you are thirsty. You are very, very thirsty. So you stand there and, and suddenly you look over there and you see this, this big lake, beautiful lake, with, with just things twinkling and, and glittering there. And, and you're asking, what is that? And they say, oh, that's al kawthar That's al kawthar That's the lake of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are you Muslim? You can go drink from there if you want. And you're like, oh, yeah, definitely. And you start going towards Hawd al kawthar And brothers and sisters, forget the drink. You're going to see the Prophet This is the first time you see him. Are you excited? And you're, you're going there and he's right there. Giving water to other people. And he sees you. And he knows you're Muslim because of the wudu that you've been doing. And you're like, Ya Rasulullah. And you're just about to hug him. And for some people, an angel will come in right between you and him. And you say, no, Prophet of Allah, do not hug him. And the Prophet will say, why? He's, he's from my ummah. And the angel will say, but you don't know what they did after you died. You don't know how they lived their life after you died. Brothers and sisters, if the Prophet lived amongst us today, amongst you today, will he be proud of you? Will he be proud of you? Think of that. But inshallah, we are from the ones that will hug the Prophet Can you imagine that hug? Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa And he'll ask, are you thirsty? I'm like, yeah. It's been rough. And he'll give you a drink from this haud, from this lake, where the water comes straight from Jannah, brothers and sisters. And after you drink from it, you'll never be thirsty again. And we're standing there. The day of judgment, the weight itself is very, very challenging. And people will wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them to hellfire just to end the wait. You know when you're waiting for the result of an interview or an application or something, and just tell me that I failed, but just tell me something. I hate the wait. You guys know that feeling. That's the feeling of the Day of Judgment times 100. So during this wait, people don't know what to do. So they all rush to Adam alayhi salam, the first creation of Allah. And they say, Adam, you are Allah's first creation. Please tell him to start the day of judgment. We can't take the weight anymore. And Adam says, no. Allah is so angry today. He's never been this angry before. Go to someone else. Go to someone else. I made a sin. I ate from the tree. And so they will all go to Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh, you are the longest prophets age-wise, and please tell Allah just to start the day of judgment, just to start it. We can't handle this. And Nuh will say, no, no, no. Allah is so angry today, so upset today, like he's never been before. And I asked him something I shouldn't have. Go to someone else. And they will go to Musa and Ibrahim, and Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, all the way up to Isa. And Isa will tell them, why are you going to us? Go to the one who can help you. Go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. A mercy to mankind, all mankind. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam will say, ana laha, ana laha. I'll do it. And brothers and sisters, 
please imagine this beautiful scene. Remember, white piece of land, the throne of Allah, all creation. The Prophet ﷺ goes up to the throne of Allah and makes sujood. Makes sujood in front of the throne of Allah and praises Allah for things that no human has ever praised him for before. And just praises Allah and thanks Allah in front of the throne until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad, irfa ra'sa. Put your head up. Put your head up. Ask. And I'll give you. Whatever you ask for, I'll give you. Intercede. And I will accept your intercession. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Allah, start the day of judgment. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he doesn't leave just yet. The Prophet ﷺ is thinking about he says, Ya Allah, what about my ummah? What are you going to do with them? Brothers and sisters, I, I, I can't express this. I can't express how much I love the Prophet ﷺ. He's thinking about no one except us. About his ummah, his followers. That's who he's thinking about, us. And he says, Ya Allah, what, what's going to happen to them? I'm worried about them. Because I know that there were strong people and there were weak people there. What's going to happen? They're my ummah. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi And Allah says, don't worry, Muhammad. I won't disappoint you today. I won't disappoint you today. And he says, Ya Muhammad. Pick 70,000 of your ummah to enter Jannah right now without any judgment, without any pain. And the Prophet says, Zidni, give me more. Not for him. He's going to Jannah. But for us. He's asking for us. And Allah says, Ya Muhammad, for every thousand, seventy thousand. Into Jannah without any judgment, without any punishment. May Allah make us all from them. And, and, and those special people are not prophets or messengers. Those are people from his ummah, just like me and you. We have a chance. We just need to work hard. At that moment, brothers and sisters, the judgment starts. And the judgment starts in a majestic scene where the sky rips open and waves and waves of angels come down and stand in a straight line in front of the throne of Allah. Then it rips open again and waves and waves of angels come down and stand in a straight line. Seven lines, one for each sky. The angels of each sky come down from the sky and stand in a line in front of Allah. And we all know this verse, subhanAllah. وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا And Allah and the angels will come in rows. And brothers and sisters, at that moment, the hardest part, the hardest part of the hereafter, the coming of hellfire. Imagine the scene again, the throne, seven lines of angels. There's, the perimeter is secure. There are angels all around us. No one is going anywhere. All the creation of Allah is in the middle. And Allah calls on hellfire to come. And hellfire, brothers and sisters, is not a pit. It is a roaring, raging beast that is held down by 70,000 chains. Holding each chain is 70,000 angels. 
وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم and Allah and the angels are standing in rows and the hellfire will come about and when the hellfire comes brothers and sisters there is no scene more terrifying on the day of judgment than that scene even the Prophet وسلم, told Umar that, Ya Umar, if you did the deeds of 70 prophets, you would still be afraid at that moment when hellfire comes. And when hellfire comes, brothers and sisters, every creation of Allah, martyrs, prophets, believers, non-believers, they will fall to their knees. وَتَرَى كُلَّ أُمَّةٍ You will see every ummah on their knees. All they are saying is, Oh Allah, protect us. Oh Allah, protect us. And hellfire comes in, raging and roaring. A neck shoots out of hellfire. And just like there are people that go to Jannah without any punishment or any judgment, there are people that will go to hellfire without any judgment. And if hellfire looks at you, then you are one of its inhabitants. So every person, their eyes are to the ground. They're afraid to look up. And all they can hear is the raging and roaring. Brothers and sisters, I want you to listen to this dialogue. I want you to listen to the words of Allah coming down from seven skies. When He tells us this in the Quran, this is the scene. This is the dialogue. Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam, alla ta'abudu al-shaytan. Innahu lakum adum mubin. Wa ana abuduni. Hada siratum mustaqim. Wa laqad adal minkum jibillan kathira. Afalam takunu ta'qilun. Hadihi jahannam. Here it is. Hadihi jahannam. Alati kuntum tu'adun. Did I not tell you, O children of Adam, that you should not worship shaitan? Verily, he is an obvious enemy to you, and that you should only worship me. This is the straight path. Allah will tell us this. And indeed, shaitan has misguided and led astray many of you. Could you not understand this? Could you not realize this? Could you not comprehend this? Here is hellfire that I promised you. Here it is. May Allah protect us, brothers and sisters. This is not a joke. When hellfire comes, it rages and roars. And it will suck people into it that will go to hellfire without any judgment. This scene ends. I'm going to close the curtains on this scene. And all you can hear and all you can see is hellfire raging and roaring and everyone on their knees, face down, saying, Allahumma sallim sallim, Allahumma sallim sallim. Oh Allah, protect us. Oh Allah, protect us.